All right, guys, good morning. Brian and I are here today with Anna Flockett. She is our friend from the UK over at uh, Startups Magazine, and she's going to talk to us today about you know what they're working on over there. We're going to talk about some tech startups, and we're going to talk about startup tips in general. So thank you so much for joining us today, Anna. We really appreciate your time. No, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. I'm so excited to, to be on your guys' podcast finally. So, Anna, tell us a little bit about Startups Magazine for, for those who don't know. It's it's only a few years old, and you guys are on a fun mission. So tell us a little bit about that. It's a startup itself. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess we are a startup ourselves. Um, we basically were created. Um, we, were, we were already in the electronics uh, the tech space and we were going to loads of different shows and uh, meeting lots of cool people that had cool uh, products and uh, solutions themselves and we were writing about them and then we learned that when it comes to startups it's a bit different than these bigger well-established companies and the engineers because it's it is about their product and what they're doing and their technology but it's also about themselves and the journey that they've been through and kind of like the founder and the team and that kind of whole um ecosystem that they're in so we decided to create this platform startups magazine to kind of give these tech startups that we'd come across uh, a voice and you know somewhere that we could kind of interview them write their stories up and then try and expose them to as many people as we can because obviously being a startup we know it is kind of hard to get yourself seen in such a kind of overcrowded space especially the tech world is you know mm. like growing incredibly which is amazing to see and especially over the past year it's just continued to grow which is yeah an incredible space to be in but it can be very competitive and obviously very difficult so our goal was to yeah, create this publication and speak to as many tech startups and get their, their name and their ideas out there to the world. And as we kind of uh, start progressing with this, we also learned that there's so many businesses and uh, other like founders that have made it and gone on to, to bigger things that want to help these startups and these businesses. They've been through it themselves um, and they've created companies that are designed to kind of help them in different stages of their life so now I would say we're kind of the especially the actual magazine that's print and digital and um, we have half that are from um you know people and businesses that are there to give you advice and help you along the way and then the other half is from the startups that we are we are interviewing and trying to expose them to as many people as we can in the world that sounds like fun. Uh, during the pandemic, right, there were a lot of startups that came about, right? That's one of the things that we saw lots of stats on. Did did you see a change in the way startups work due to the pandemic? Yeah, so obviously the, the world has been becoming digital for, for a while now, um, even before the pandemic, but I, we definitely saw a shift in businesses either shifting their business model slightly to become more digital or a lot of businesses starting with a new idea designed to help people in the digital world. Um, so we um, we spoke to one business, um, it was called My Local Dot Delivery, and they, they had another business model. They were in like the marketing, uh, digital uh, advertising space, and they'd create this kind of like side startup um, that was for all the businesses um, locally that didn't have a digital presence. So they people could access these shops and these local farm shops and these local businesses that they they probably still needed supplies from, um, but they didn't have any kind of like technology experience or like I say, digital presence, didn't really have much social media or anything. They could then be listed on here and they could connect people during the pandemic that couldn't go out um, digitally. So yeah, we saw a, a lot of, um, startups start up in the digital side the digital sector I mean there's been a lot more apps <laughs> um, yeah. over the year and a half as well um, some that have done amazing some that haven't so much um, and yeah we have seen businesses kind of like shift and pivot um, their business model slightly that are, and then have taken it um, more digitally. You know one of the things that I worry about um, is that all these businesses that kind of started up this thing to cater to folks during the pandemic, which was necessary, you know, is that, um, 
what's the word I'm looking for? Is that um, was it temporary? Is that what you're asking? Right. Yes. Yes. Is is there going? Can you know? Is that going to be long, long lasting? Really? You know? Or or is it just kind of like a fad because you know it was needed and it was it was great and it was helpful? You know? And that's what always worries me about these things that kind of pop up based on a need in the moment. You know, it, that might be a temporary need. I think there's probably arguments for yes and no to answer that question. So, for example, as I was saying, the world was shifting digitally anyway. It's like most people that I speak to now, they're like, if you don't have a website or a digital presence, no matter what your business is in, you're really going to struggle going forward. Um, so all these kind of businesses that have popped up, they're especially the, the digital ones, like I was saying, there is a need for them. I mean, there's always going to be someone who's got an idea that there's already something similar out there there's always going to be you know like a, a like we were saying at the beginning a crowded space especially in the the tech and the digital world so not everyone will make it but most startup founders that I speak to have either tried something before and that's not quite worked and then they've tried again I think being an entrepreneur you have to be quite a resilient bounce back sort of person so even if your business hasn't made it chances are you you might go for something else that will make it or you'll just change it slightly I know I've spoken to founders that have started an idea in one way and then realized that was an absolute terrible idea so not kind of like finish the business off completely just you know reevaluated their decisions and which way that they were taking the business and their business models and then realize that there was a different direction for it for it to go in I mean one example they're not quite startups anymore because they're, they're huge and I don't know I, sh I assume you guys have them over there but there was obviously Deliveroo, Justy, Uber Eats you know they they're all the same but they're all thriving they're all making it and there's there's even little ones popping up now like local ones mm. um, are still making it because at the moment there is such that need for it because obviously during the pandemic we can go out we can eat out um so they may see business business decline slightly but i think now we've been introduced to that kind of luxury of life having yeah. all these takeouts and this food being delivered to us i don't think we're going to go back so i don't think you know they'll they'll fall off and disappear completely um in a couple of years time if there's not as as much a demand they might pivot even more i mean even more recently i've seen on some of them that they now do deliver uh, like grocery mm -hmm. delivery so it's not just like fast food they now will go to like your local shop and they'll just bring you some some bread and some milk <laughs> and some if you want so yeah like i think there's there's ways of adapting um right. and i think you constantly need to adapt and you constantly need to be thinking of the next thing if you are gonna kind of like make this and I have to say overcrowded cutthroat industry. <laughs> right. And I think to Anna's point, you know, they're, they're entrepreneurs. They're going to try different right. things. But also, too, remember, they're also building some core technology. Like you right. said, they're shifting from maybe food delivery to grocery de deliveries. Mm -hmm. but, and once they built that core technology or that IP, they, they have that to use in right. different aspects, right? So it's once you have those tools, how can you use those tools? It becomes really important for a startup. That's yeah. a great point. Yeah. So now you mentioned something else. Now, how how long is a startup a startup, right? <laughs> so so you mentioned like it, these are, they aren't really a startup anymore. But so how long? What's the time frame on being a startup? <laughs> this is such a good question. I mean, we ask this question to startups that we speak to. I'm like, so when is a startup not really a startup? And I think everyone has uh, different different answers to this question. For me. I think there's like a number of contributing factors. So for example, like if you've gone through a number of different funding rounds and you are, you've raised like millions on multiple occasions, I think that's one contributing factor. Um, I'm not saying if you've, if you have, you know, been through four running rounds and you've, you've um, raised 2 million, then you're no longer a startup because I know some uh, businesses that have done that, but still, like have a long way to go they've still got so much more that they want to plan and to give and they've still only got like a small team um and then there's an, another contributing factor i think is how big the team is mm -hmm. like we've spoken to people that have been running you know for for eight nine years and they still only have like a team of between five and ten because you know they're not there yet to scale to that capacity whereas 
I guess maybe when Deliveroo started out, they were like tiny and now they must have like thousands of employees. Uber is another example. Like I know that there's definitely like thousands of people working for them. Um, do people still consider them a startup? Probably not because of the amount of money they've made and the the amount of um, the amount of team members they now have. So they've scaled. So I think it's a combination of how much money you've raised, how many has your team grown to, and how long you have been running. But it, it's not as black and white as saying, right, if you've been running 10 years, you are no longer a startup. <laughs> <laughs> as I say, yeah. you could be running like two years, have raised 10 million and now have a team of like 10,000 people. Well, I personally wouldn't necessarily call you a startup. But I think, yeah, it is down to people's personal opinions. But I think it's, yeah, contributing factors kind of add up. It's like a point system. <laughs> so there's no set formula, right? It's not like you yeah. know, 10 years, you'd, you're out of startup phase or, you know, 50 employees or whatever the case is. No. And like, we never say, oh, you can't be featured in startups. And I think <laughs> you have this, this and this. Like sometimes people say, oh, can we be featured? And, and they have like been running 10 years and they have like hundreds of employees. And I'm like, do you consider yourselves a startup? Like, really? <laughs> That's what I was going to say. How many times do you guys look and go, yeah, no, not a startup. This doesn't like, apply. Like, but, I, but I went outside and I raised some money from the guy on the street corner. Hey, come on, I'm a startup, right? Exactly. Like, I've got this new idea. That doesn't make you a startup, guys. Come on. <laughs> So, you know, I, you, we're talking about food delivery and, and I think that's that's been a big trend. You know, I, I was reading up on on startups recently about the digitization of groceries. And I think that's a big um, I think there will continue to be a, a trend there in in groceries. I mean, quite frankly, I, I love the idea of not going to the grocery store myself. Um, I don't I don't know about anybody else, um, but there are some other there are some other trends, you know, that we've seen over the past year, um, you know, again, some that were already starting. So, you know, obviously grocery delivery wasn't new. Um, but, you know, when we think about remote work, I think that's another trend that's, that's um, you know, I think we're in this place where some businesses are going to return full time and then there will be some that never return again. And then there will be this hybrid model. And Brian talks about this all the time. Um you know, but have have you been working? Have you been covering a lot of of companies that are working in the um, remote work space? Yeah, definitely. So we actually um, there was a, an event recently in the kind of like startup scene um, that was literally focused on remote working and remote businesses and uh, startups in the kind of remote scene. Um, and one particular uh, startup I spoke to was called like Loop Team. Mm -hmm. And the the founder was explaining to me, uh, it's, it's a, obviously a software um, solution, a, a platform that you like log into. And he was saying how before kind of COVID, um, everyone would have, you know, your, your online calendars and your Zooms and your meetings and everything spread out. But you'd also be in the office and like, there would be set meetings that we all have as a, as a group in the office with certain people or everyone or et cetera, et cetera. But I might see someone on another team and I think oh, I've got a question for them. And I'd look over, Oh, you know, they've got their headset on or they're typing away. They're really busy. I won't, I won't bother them now. I'll go over in a minute and ask them a question. And then when they are free, you just walk over and you have like a two minute conversation about mm -hmm. a question and it's all sorted. When we shifted to the remote working because we had to, because it was locked down. Obviously we had Zoom and we had Teams and we had every other software that, that you can use um, as, a, as an office to communicate with each other. And they were useful, but you didn't have that kind of like personal, personalization. Mm -hmm to be like oh I won't bother Nicola, Nicola at the moment she's she's busy or you know she's away from her desk so I won't at the moment you know ping her with a question mm -hmm. you you kind of lost that personalization and so they developed this uh, solution called loop team and if you're online you can like set your status and then people would know or if you just click on someone's name your your camera would like pop up if you wanted your camera and you might be on and then you just ask a question and if they were busy then they can just reject that or <laughs> uh, do you know what I mean so it was trying to bring these that office environment because 
it is hard like obviously remote working now is so much easier than it probably was five ten years ago because of all the softwares and solutions that we have and like you say it kind of is the future and people had already started toying with it slightly but there's definitely going to be like a hybrid model um come the future so um how do you make it more you know seamless how do you make it easier for everyone rather than just you know, trying to send an email and then waiting an hour or so for it to reply because they didn't right. see the notification pop up. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, yeah, these little like solutions and platforms, um, they're just going to get better and better and and hopefully make that remote working even easier than it already is. But yeah, it's a huge space right now. As I, as I was saying, um, there was this whole kind of like mini it was it was meant to take place in person but obviously with covid we couldn't um so it was this um online and virtual event um completely focused on like remote working and all the different kind of startups and businesses in the remote working space and all the solutions that they had to help conquer remote working now, this yeah. is probably a question not just for startups but right there you know as we've we see people shifting to go back into the office right and there's some people that are going to be resistant to that right you know, so how is that going to affect companies, especially startups where they may need those people in the right. office because they, they need that team building? Because especially smaller companies, some of them, it remote, 100% remote may be great, right? But, you know, for some of them, they may need those those teams in the office because they are a small team. How is that going to affect it if some employees decide not to go back or they don't mm -hmm. want to go back or whatever the case is? Is there going to be some issues? I, yeah, I mean, I definitely think so. If if people are going to want to re remote work completely like full time, I think that would be an issue in any sense, but definitely for startups, because like you say, they are such small teams and it's so fast paced, like the startups um, world, even before COVID um, was probably the, the ones used to um, uh, what COVID was going to bring to us, because realistically, they didn't always work like nine to five. They didn't have set offices a lot of them use like workspaces and then you can like use different workspaces across whatever kind of area you're in and you could be like hot desk in so it wasn't like that regimented nine to five you're in the office with the same people every day um and obviously that's what kind of covid brought to us and that's maybe what the future is but i think um definitely it's going to be a problem if you're if you want to be completely remote as we say like you know zoom and video calls and conferences and meetings is it's great it's fantastic it's a great way but at the same time like just sitting there and having a conversation with people bouncing ideas off each other especially when you're working in like hardware um tech tech startups obviously like our kind of sector you're going to need to be working together you know does this work does this work mm -hmm. you're going to doing like research and development you're going to need to be like do you know what i mean flexible work mm -hmm. is kind of a criteria for a startup which right. has pros and cons because obviously like like you say it's not nine to five so if if you want to come in later in the mornings because you've got kids or whatever personal mm -hmm. reason you've got it does work well but you also have to to give back do you know what i mean it's it's mm -hmm. about the give and the take so i think it definitely will cause problems if people want to remote work 100% but I don't think that will be the case for most people I think having this remote working life for the past year and a half if they didn't work remotely um, at least some of the time before they will have had a taste and maybe think yeah I don't want to go back to the office full time mm -hmm. um but I think yeah a, a good mixture is probably healthy for for people in in most ways it's probably best for productivity and it's best for creativity when you are together you probably speak to each other more when you do see each other then because it's right. like a bit of a luxury isn't it so you might be bouncing each other's uh, bouncing ideas off each other more than you you may have done before yeah i, I really like what you said there about the um uh, startups being probably being in a better position to tackle remote work than other companies because i mean Think about that. I feel I always thought if you start as a remote company, you're obviously better off than, you know, a company that's transitioning. So that's a really, you know, good point. I, startups are probably in the best possible position. And and to your um, last point there, even it's almost pr productivity wise, even better to have a hybrid model, because think about how much I mean, I know how much I get done when I'm just sitting here. Um, 
you know, but there is that other element. So it's almost like your productive days are the days you're home. And then like your creative days and your collaborative days are the days you're in the office. So you kind of get the, the best of both worlds. I, I, I like that idea. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I, I've been saying for a long time, well, since the pandemic started now, for people I speak to, if there was any like type of person cut out for a pandemic, it is a entrepreneur, it's a founder. <laughs> is they you know they've been used to this remote kind of like catastrophic up and down where are we working where are we not working remote <laughs> working you can work from a coffee shop you can work from your dining table they were completely used to that life and they've been hit with so many hurdles so many challenges so many like different obstacles to get past being a founder like it's one of the biggest questions we ask like what the biggest challenge has been for you like how do you overcome these challenges and these hurdles well I think the pand a pandemic and a national lockdown is probably going to be one of the biggest hurdles so yeah <laughs> if there was anyone cut out for a pandemic it probably is a, a business founder <laughs> right and you know I mean you know entrepreneurs you know what was nice is they didn't have like 10 million dollar rental offices or build outs or crazy yeah. you know crazy overhead that wind up you know like some of these bigger you know well established companies had mm -hmm. you know at the time when the when the pandemic started so yeah no exactly like for for some people it has been super hard like office wise you know people must have lost out so much money um and then obviously for others they're kind of used to it you know working from from wherever they can or what what whatever situation they can um i think workspaces obviously it's hit as well um I, I know some of them stayed open because um some startups were kind of classed as key workers and they still wanted to continue working and they couldn't work from home for whatever reason so there was exceptional circumstances um but yes yeah, some workspaces have been open and but it's been tough on them because obviously the numbers have been so much lower um and there's not that kind of like community feel right um, to the industry but hopefully they'll bounce back like that's what that's what startups do so what are, what are some some of the common threads some of the common core things you see for successful startups i think um like being a, a business founder you definitely have to be like a certain type of person i always say i'm not sure if i would completely be cut out to start and run my own business <laughs> um but i think it's you've got to have this as cliche as it sounds and as obvious as it sounds you've got to have this like massive passion and drive for what you are doing like the the founders i've spoken to you can just hear it in, especially the ones that you you know are going to do well or have previously done well you can just hear that they are like living breathing sleeping eating their business and and the the industry and their products and they really believe in it so i think it's it's you've got to have that passion and that drive, but you've also got to be, I've used the word resilient already, but like a sort of person that can really take the tough times, you're gonna be faced with so many challenges. And one of the biggest challenges that I know pretty much everyone faces is like imposter syndrome and self doubt. And, you know, like questioning yourself and the decisions that you've got to make, because most of the time they're completely just on you unless you've got a co-founder and then it's obviously like 50-50 on you. Um, <laughs> then like you've got to overcome that massive personal barrier um, and not doubt yourself and completely believe in yourself and the, the product that you've created, which I know most startups do. Um, and that's obviously why they have made it. But yeah, like you you have got to have these, these certain qualities to to go the, the long way so it seems like it's a lot of self-belief right mm -hmm. so it's belief in self it seems to be one of the strongest traits yeah. yeah i think if you honestly believe in yourself obviously you need to have a good idea um and like a you know a viable product that is going to work for other people um but like if you believe in something i really think you can make it work even if like i'm not explaining this very well like if i had an idea that was an amazing idea and i i believed in it but then <laughs> nicola you had an idea that was it was still a good idea but it wasn't as good as my idea but you really believed in it you like every time you spoke to someone you know what i mean you could literally like convince people that the sky was green because of how much you believed in it if right. you have that belief I, I honestly think that you can go further with a a mediocre idea than if mm -hmm. you amazing idea but you didn't have that drive and that passion and that belief in yourself and the product mm -hmm. that would be 
long-winded way of explaining that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So in essence, we're talking about almost like grit, what we would call grit, right? You know, and where, you know, we, we see this all the time, you know, with athletes, right? Sometimes they just outwork athletes that have are naturally more athletic because they just have the will or the drive or whatever it is to do it. So it's outworking sometimes. It's that grit, like staying to your mission, you know? That yeah. Definitely. Also. If you have that... Uh, the determination and you you know once you if you're that sort of person and you set your mind to it you're like i am gonna do this then i, I don't think there's much that can stop you <laughs> well anna can you tell us what your favorite tech startup is okay all right that's a heavy question all right what are some of your favorite tech startups that you've seen over the course of your time with startups magazine no definitely well as i said as you said there's going to be far too many to mention mm -hmm. Um, but a few that obviously always kind of spring to mind um, are probably the ones that have like the the soft personal touch. So there was um, one um, founder lady, she's called um, Joanna, and um, she founded a company called Little Riot. And uh, it was just before the pandemic. And it was it was a little monitor that you could put with um, babies that were like prematurely born or like were in hospital and they couldn't be with their mums and the mum would have one device and the baby would have the other device and the mum could like have hear the baby's heartbeat and the vice versa. And then that was kind of used um, as well. It was adapted. Um, in COVID, people that were in like long distance relationships or like handling their family, they could also have these two um devices and kind of like have that extra connection with each other without you know being in person and it just kind of brought people together in a in a tough time so that was that was a lovely one she um she actually won one of the awards at our hustle awards last year we like to do a little awards every year and celebrate some of the amazing people that we've seen so she she won that last year and that was amazing to see um, and then I guess maybe one more, I guess, really fun one um, that I'll mention is, um, especially for us girls, um, a girl <laughs> I met and was talking to, she's creating like virtual reality to measure a uh, girl's bra sizes because she's oh. worked in the bra industry for so long. And she was like, no one is wearing the right bra size. And I was like, I know. I was like... <laughs> if I go into a shop I've no idea what to buy and like most girls you speak to will probably say they've got one bra that they've had for years and they'll never throw it away because it fits right and then mm -hmm. you try and buy the exact same bra in the exact same size and they just never fit the same so she's developing this technology um that can like completely measure you um hopefully but she's trying to adapt it now to be completely virtual because obviously covid she's not been able to do anything in person and um yeah like it just measures you and make sure that girls are wearing the right sizes for them and it's comfortable and it's like healthy for them and yeah so i was like that is amazing that is something that we need in this mm -hmm. <laughs> do you know how the in-person version worked was it like a scanner how, how what, what was it i'm curious <laughs> It was very early stage, so she hadn't quite developed anything like that. But it was, yeah, it was like using um, like virtual reality, so like taking pictures. Oh. Um, and then she was like using this technology software that like compared it all, and then like it would give you your perfect bra size. And you could really, Brian, do you need to check your bra size? No, uh, yeah. Okay. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> but then she go one step further and 3D print the bra. I'm just saying. <laughs> Literally, you could. Right. You could. Yeah. There was also one um, really amazing. He was actually based in New York, actually. Um, he was called Amin from Blue Hot Hero. And his original startup idea was uh, to 3D print, um, like, prosthetics or like different parts for people that struggled. So it started with a guy who'd um, lost his hand or his wrist or something like that and he couldn't uh, write or draw anymore so he'd like 3d printed this attachment that he could um use a pen or a pencil and like um kind of like get through um the the struggle that way and during the pandemic he um obviously stopped working and he was using his 3d printing to create 3d print ppe for all the hospitals in new york and the surrounding mm -hmm. areas so i was like that is that is an incredible story anyways and then to obviously add on the work that you were doing during the pandemic it was it's just amazing to see what people were actually doing to help in these times 
and and how creative people are getting with with some of these things you know and, and you know i mean we we spoke about this a little bit like you know shifting but it's it's amazing and passion right and how people see this need for certain things like that you know that heart monitor or you know custom bra sizing and they they sort of go okay i I'm so passionate about this one thing. I'm going to figure out how to make it better for yeah. everyone who needs it. Yeah, no, definitely. And it's most of the time from like personal experiences. So then you know that it's kind of going to benefit someone because you've been through it yourself and you needed a solution for it or, you know, it, there was a problem that needed fixing and then they're, they're going to be helping other people. So, yeah, it's, it is lovely to hear what people are, are doing to help others. Well, this was a lot of fun, Anna. Is there anything else you'd like to leave us with today? And if not, please tell us where everybody can learn more about Startups Magazine. Yeah, no, definitely. Please do get in contact. Um, we are always looking for more startups to, you know, speak to and help and connect with people that we can help with. So it's uh, www.startupsmagazine.co.uk. Uh, we have a podcast ourselves, um, The Serial Entrepreneur, where we talk to, you know, inspiring people that have done done it themselves and been through some of the, the, the treacherous <laughs> challenges um but yeah no thank you so much for having me and it's it's just a pleasure really to talk about all these amazing businesses and the amazing things that they are doing thanks again anna we really appreciate your time today thank you